Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Muy Pit Podcast. I am your host, Christian Renteria. I'm going to talk about the creature from the Black Lagoon. It's celebrating its 70th, 70th anniversary this year, and uh, I thought, what better way than to talk about that? It's also the first time that we're actually talking about uh, one of the classic Universal monsters, which I am a huge fan of. Uh, and I have mentioned them in passing, but uh, I've never actually sat down and done a full episode on them and i figured uh why not start with one that's celebrating an anniversary and that just happened to be the creature from the black lagoon this kind of episode was inspired because of the anniversary and because there's also a lot of other anniversaries that are being celebrated this year especially for horror movies but i want to talk about this one because uh i (laughs) missed out on watching it in in theater so i kind of just wanted to watch it um at home anyway i was in la at the end of last month uh, of september uh, if anybody you know follow me on on, on there and, and probably saw that i was uh, and they were playing this at the new beverly but of course they were playing it after i already left so i was really bummed that i didn't get to um to watch that but anyway the gill man as he is called or sometimes he's called the creature was here's a little bit of backstory on, on stuff because you guys know on rewatches i like to give you a little bit of history that i can find uh just a little quick bits nothing you know too uh crazy but uh the gill man as he is called in in the universe in, in or the creature again we'll call him the gill man because that's kind of what he's commonly referred to um he is one of the newer creatures he wasn't one of the original ones obviously the original ones were dracula frankenstein the mummy uh even the bride of frankenstein and they you know all came out in the 30s uh from universal the wolfman came into the picture in the 40s uh and then the mashups uh, of, of, of some of them started to happen that also came in uh the 40s you know the the universal monsters uh the multiple times have met abbott and costello uh so uh, those movies are still very funny even to this day uh, abbott and costello will never be out of never be out of fashion uh we'll talk about probably those uh sometime next year but uh the 50s came around and universal needed to revive the genre a little bit it kind of it didn't get stale but it wasn't as successful as they thought it was uh and uh they needed to create a new monster and they created one in the gill man and uh aka the creature from the black lagoon and the rest is pretty much history because he is considered of course one of the classic universal monsters uh being in the early days the movie was designed and shot uh, it with 3D in mind because 3D movies were doing very well at the time. I obviously did not watch this movie in 3D because uh, I don't have a 3D TV, but 2D works just as fine uh, as well. Two guys. Uh, the movie was a hit with everyone and even got two sequels. Uh, the first came out the following year and then the third one came out the following year after that. So they came out three years in a row. They came out um, with all these movies. Uh, the third movie, uh, The Creature walks among us which is what it's called uh was not shot and released in 3d because by that time which if you're keeping track it's 1956 uh the format wasn't as successful as it once was uh so we won't be talking about the sequels in this episode other than you know uh shouting them out as i just did right now other things i want to shout out are the influence that the movie has had uh obviously the gill man has popped in uh u- other universal monster mashup movies uh not as many as his compatriots like dracula or frankenstein or wolfman those seem to be the common ones uh but uh in tv obviously he's appeared in tv episodes he was in the monster squad which we'll probably also talk about sometime next year on spooky season uh which was not done by universal so he wasn't really the gill man and those weren't really dracula and frankenstein and wolfman and mummy and all that uh because of you know rights issues and stuff like that but still very good movie worth your time uh, if you want to watch a monster squad Uh, of course i think the big one that we all know at least in terms of uh inspiration and um influence in even today's culture is of course uh today's you know uh nerdy culture is uh guillermo del toro's the shape of water del toro has admitted that the that movie the shape of water was uh, that it was very much influenced by the the creature from the black lagoon and he took a lot of inspiration from that he also loves the creature from the black lagoon uh, the original movie and um we'll talk about del toro because he does have a connection to the creature from the black lagoon we'll talk about that at the end of the podcast uh but you can probably if you you know pay you know any kind of close attention to the movie news cycle maybe you remember this i don't remember this 
but it, it does make sense considering Del Toro's uh, history uh, and um, his influences that he's had. So uh, there is that. Uh, another big influence is obviously if you see the movie, if you see this movie, and then maybe you watch Jaws right afterwards, you can probably see a little influence there uh, as well. Uh, a little bit about the filming. Uh, they shot majority of this on the Universal backlot, which if you do the backlot tour, they'll probably maybe you know depending on who you get, they'll probably mention that. Uh, and Ben Chapman, who plays the Gill Man, filmed all his scenes, all his scenes anyway, where he was on land. Uh, the suit for the Gill Man, however, was very hot. And in between takes, he would he would cool down uh, in the lake that the lot had in the back. And they would even also hose him down. Uh, so uh, because it was very hot, the suit. And uh, it was very obviously it's in California. So it was also very hot over there. And they had long 14 hour days. So, uh, yeah, I, I would assume you would probably get hot. Uh, not only that, he could barely see through the mask that they created. And at one point, he even scraped his co-star uh, Julie Adams's head on something while he was carrying her. Uh, some people say that he knocked her out, uh, but Ju uh, Julie, uh, Julie Adams, sorry, uh, that's gonna happen. I guarantee you, that's gonna happen one, more than more than once. Uh, Julie Adams kind of denied those as the years went on. She's like, no, he, she just he just scraped my head on something. I was fine. Uh, the underwater scenes were shot all the way across the country in Florida. And that, again, wasn't Chapman. He did all these scenes where he was on land and everything. Uh, anytime the Gilman was in the water, that was played by uh, Rico U. Browning, who um, uh, there was a thing going on that he had a lighter suit as opposed to Chapman's suit, who was darker. Uh, but Browning has kind of, you know, th did the kind of convention circuits at the time. And he was saying that that wasn't true. But, um, you know, give or take, maybe, maybe there was a little bit, uh, lightening and a little bit of darkening in suits, but it probably wasn't so massive, uh, as probably maybe some people, you know, um, uh, assumed he was, uh, this is a pretty big thing. I didn't know this until I was doing, you know, research for the episode. Uh, apparently because they shot obviously in different parts of the country and obviously it's very different nowadays as opposed to back then, like premiere wise, you know, where you pretty much meet your, you know, cast members all the time. Chapman and Browning didn't meet until 20 years later. So they didn't meet until the seventies. Uh, they met at a convention and that was the first time they met, which I thought was very interesting. But again, it's, it's a different time back in, you know, back in the golden days of Hollywood. Uh, we'll talk about the design of Gilman because this is, uh, interesting. I, 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 I've, assume that i think i actually kind of knew the story because some of it sounded familiar but uh again doing the research uh, a little bit of research that i did for the movie i didn't know this so the design of the Gilman for a long time was credited only to the legendary makeup artist bud westmore and bud westmore is no slouch if you know anything about makeup and um you know, makeup artists and practical effects, uh, especially back in the day, Bud Westmore was the guy. He was the man, and he his name is synonymous with you know uh, Hollywood, especially in the olden days. Uh, so so he's no slouch. He's a legend in the business for a reason. But for some reason, for a long time, he was the only one credited for the design um, of the movie, which was not true. And so literally, like decades later it was revealed that the approved designer was a disney animator of all people uh millicent patrick who i think was bud westmore's boss at that time or at that point so it was funny that kind of patrick was like yeah that's fine you know let him take credit it doesn't matter but the design of it was was her idea and i guess they came up with it together but westmore got you know more of the acclaim for it that was the overall design was them the design of the bodysuit uh, was created by Jack Cavan, uh, who worked on the Wizard of Oz just, you know, years earlier. Um, and I, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know this. Um, he also did, um, uh, stuff for amputees, uh, during the war, which I thought was really, really cool. And I already had a huge respect for, you know, anybody. I have a huge respect for anybody who worked in the golden days of Hollywood because, they obviously didn't have the same budget as we do. And everything obviously had to be done practical. And you watch a lot of those older movies and you're like, man, they, you know, they did a lot of this for real. And, you know, maybe a little bit of, you know, digital effects or, you know, uh, matte paintings and background 
to create depth, but um, that was pretty cool. So I have a huge respect for that. And I also have a huge respect for, you know, anybody in the film industry, especially at that time, because obviously they were going through the world wars and that was, you know, saw a lot of them, you know, ended up going to war and then coming back and, you know, they found their job, you know, they still were able to find jobs in Hollywood or, you know, it got a little, you know, harder for them when they came back. But um, I didn't know that about Jack Cavan. And um, when I found that out, I thought that was really, really cool. Uh, anyway, uh, moving on the so he did the bodysuit uh the head the head sculpture uh was created by chris muller jr and i mentioned that because he's a illinois boy he's i'm from illinois i, I always want to shout out the the illinois natives uh here on the podcast as much as i can but um there's another uh headpiece story uh which i will also talk about um on the post watch uh thoughts uh for that as well uh, so I think that's enough base level information for what we have on the creature from the back lagoon. Let's get to the movie. Obviously spoilers ahead. Uh, it's a shorter movie. I'm not going to go beat for beat like I usually do, but, uh, we are going to talk about a great chunk of the movie. And again, it's a rewatch. It's a very old movie. So if you don't want to be spoiled on a 70 year old movie, uh, here's your spoiler. Uh, here's your spoiler warning. So for those not in the know, the movie follows a group of scientists who go to the Amazon when they uncover the hand of a prehistoric creature. Uh, hoping to find the skeleton or the other remains or any other remains of it they go deeper into the amazon eventually finding a lagoon where there they finally meet the titled creature or the gill man as he's called again uh, internally and it becomes a battle of survival the research team includes a couple in Kay and david played by julie adams and richard carlson their boss mark played by richard dennings edwin a, another person a part of the team uh, played by Whit bassell carl maya played by antonio moreno who uh, was the one who discovered the the hand of the the original gill man and then the captain of the ship they're on called the rita captain lucas played by nestor pavia uh, the movie does take its time showing the Gill Man, and it's only his hand for a long time. It's like just his hand across people's faces as he uh, murders them off screen, of course. And then we do get to see him in all his glory uh, with the score that they play for him. It's uh, it's pretty cool to see him uh, it, when he's you know out of the water and even in the water as well, because that's in the water. It's also very impressive. Uh, anyway. When they get there, uh, Mark, the boss, immediately is like, when, when they see the Gill Man in, in all of his glory again, uh, he's like, no, we gotta, you know, we gotta bring the creature back. You know, we'll be rich. This is a, a huge discovery for science. And it's kind of implied that, you know, maybe they're not uh, uh, getting, you know, all the, the, the research and the glory that they, you know, that they want and, and then he desires. Uh, so he's that guy of the group. He's the guy that's like, you know, we gotta keep the expedition going even though people are dying around us. So he's that guy, and he wants to bring the Gilman back alive. So again, they can get the, the nor, nor, noriety, it's a hard word to say, of it all. But yeah, uh, it, again, people keep dying around him. He's like, no, I, I, I want to bring him back. Uh, and even though he has that idea, it's like, oh, hey, by the way, here's my giant spear gun. <laughs> that i have that launches harpoons at people uh, or launches har- harpoons at the gill man which he takes the gill man gets a few spears in him and he uh he just shook those off like it was nothing so um he's a he's a pretty tough bastard that gill man uh and he's so he's killing you know the crew off one by one uh and even after they capture him because they do capture him at one point uh he then escapes and uh, escapes and, and uh to a point that david the the level-headed one even though he is also like oh yeah i want to discover this thing but he's like no uh this thing keeps killing us <laughs> and uh we want to go like there's there is no point we're just scientists like there, it's you know in the movie they're like no we got to keep going it's like at this point this guy is like no no we're scientists we're not equipped for this thing that is killing us off one by one this creature that is killing us off one by one so like we gotta go and mark is like no we're not leaving i'm in charge we are going to capture it again like we did the first time and we are going to take it back with us and at that point it's kind of a i don't want to say it's a mutiny of the other crew because the other crew is like the other crew is all for like no yeah we gotta go like you're the only one that you're the only stupid one that wants to stay and get potentially killed by the gill man and captain lucas pulls out a knife uh, and he tells him you're not in charge I am, and everyone's like, we're leaving. 
and they're like okay and like they know the gill man they've seen him they've even gone to his cave at this point that he has uh which is a nice kind of little set um in the movie as well uh it's, we don't spend, we don't spend a, a ton of time there uh just kind of like a, a brief little moment here and then uh, at the end as well so they're about to leave until they get to the opening of the lagoon that's blocked by tree branches uh, and logs and a bunch of them like the, the sea it looks like on top it's like oh like you can just totally plow through those but no at the bottom they make it a point that it's like it's a lot of them uh and mark sees this as a uh oh well that's enough for me we're stuck here we might as well just go back and go get the gill man right guys guys right right and david's like fine we'll do it your way and they try to go back for the gill man and of course he ends up killing mark by basically drowning him it's almost like it's really the only kill that we see on screen kind of if i remember correctly um he is the only real kill and kind of a deserved because you know obviously he was like the guy that's like no we got to keep going guys like we want to get rich right 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 and it's like no we want to go home we want to live uh this thing is killing us off one by one and um he basically kind of just drowns because this is an underwater sequence and it's him and david and they're going after the gill man and the gill man finds him first and he kind of just like rolls him around kind of like a crocodile you know how crocodiles kill people like kill their their prey by like um kind of like spinning around um that's kind of what the gill man does i, I found that kind of interesting and nice little tidbit there like nice, nice little cool detail there in that uh and then he kind of just like rips the the oxygen uh tank hose off and uh we just see mark's dead body kind of just floating in the water so he's really kind of the only one that deserves it because he's like you're, come on dude like you you see everybody is not cool with this like just just leave uh so he's really the only death that's like deserved because everyone else is pretty likable for the most part i mean there's we do you know we don't get a lot of like we don't get too much in the detail like we know that like david and Kay are like in a relationship and and i think one of the characters like ends up joking to them at one point like why aren't you guys married yet and Kay's like i don't know why aren't we married yet david you know it's not but it's not like in that kind of like you know passive aggressive way it's like oh it's like you know that those like 1950s ways like oh like you know we'll get married like we're basically married david's like we're basically married already so what's the point um so everyone's kind of likable here with this uh so david finally gets you know uh back up to the boat and at, at this point the gill man ends up stealing k he ends up kidnapping k like a ninja because no one hears him he's like the michael myers of the lagoon you can't hear him until it's too late so the gill man takes uh k and he ends up taking her to the cave for reasons we don't know what the reasons are i mean we got a moment where the gill man uh well with k rather um goes into the lagoon when they first get there she goes for like a swim when like all the guys are like in the actual ship and we see the gill man kind of like swimming around her and like nipping at her feet and even grabbing her at one point um but it's not like he's aiming for her it's not like he's going just directly for her it's not like oh a beauty and the beast kind of thing it's just probably like she's the only woman in the movie and he just happens to see her. he's like well i guess i'll just take her instead so it, it it's not really it's up it's up in the air kind of for the most part like i've never like really like read into it people have read into it um and i guess you know we kind of got a variation of it uh with uh, sh the shape of water which again i'll talk a little bit more about uh later anyway dave um sees it goes after her because he just assumes that the gill man's taking her back to the cave which he does and dave gets there gill man and him get into a little bit of a fight the captain and carl come in they shoot up Gilman, uh, who's taking it like, again, taking it like a champ, like the spears, but you know, he's getting shot up a lot. Uh, and he finally kind of leaves the cave, kind of stumbles out of it and he dives into the lagoon and he sinks below to the credits. And that's the movie. That's the creature from the black lagoon. Just him dumping, you know, going into the water. And that's the movie for the, for, you know, there's a lot of other stuff, but, uh, post rewatch thoughts here. I was trying to remember uh, when the last time I watched this movie all the way through, because I had seen like bits and pieces of it every, you know, every now and then. And I realized it has been a while since I have sat down and watched this movie in its entirety, because there's stuff that I don't remember of this movie. There's a point in the movie where they have like this powder stuff. And I, I forgot to write down what they, what it actually was. 
But that whole sequence of them, like, powdering down the the gill man underwater uh, to kind of, like, you know, make him woozy and kind of, like, get him off balance and everything. I totally forgot about that. I forgot that they captured him and that he was on the boat. I really did. I also don't remember how watching it now, maybe it's because I'm watching it through a modern lens, um, how kind of slow paced the movie is in a lot of parts. Cause it's everything from the moment they get to the lagoon to the final act, uh, when our human characters are finally fighting the gill man, it's a little slow. And again, I don't remember if it's just because I don't remember it being that slow. Maybe I just totally forgot about it. Or maybe it's because I'm watching it through a modern day lens it's a little slow paced. I don't mind slow paced movies, obviously. Slow burn, totally okay. But watching this movie as a slow paced movie, it was like, oh, this is kind of this is kind of slow. Um, but you know, whatever. Uh, it, it, it's not detriment to the movie. It's fine. I also don't remember him opening his mouth that much. Like he just opens his mouth from time to time. It's, it's a nice little character, you know, detail. Um, but I just don't remember him opening his mouth very often. Uh, it was really cool to watch it again. I, I will say that. It felt like, it, again, it felt, I, I, I know I haven't watched this movie all the way through in a while. I did feel bad for the Gill Man at the end because all he wanted to do was be with someone. And he chose, of all people, he chose Julia Adams, which not even today, not too bad in the eyes. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, it's just been a while since I watched it. And this is kind of the first Universal Monsters movie that, again, we've talked have we've talked about on the podcast uh, in its entirety. And uh, I will definitely do more of these in the future definitely probably more for spooky season but uh i mentioned i had a headpiece story uh that i wanted to mention i didn't mention it when we were talking about the movie because i just wanted to you know get everything flowing out there uh during the fight between uh gill man and z z has the machete right that we all see and even though chapman and uh gozier I, again i hope i'm not pronouncing that last name right uh rehearsed the scene for days even on set the day of the fight and because of the design of the headpiece that Chapman had to wear for the gill, for the gill man, Chapman couldn't really see that well. And uh, apparently he missed the timing on uh, when Goizier swung. And in the timing that he missed, the machete... And again, this is just a report. I don't know how true this is. And I wanted to do a little bit more research on this, and I, I just didn't get to it in time. Uh, the machete struck the headpiece... And it got lodged in the headpiece. And everyone was just thankful that A, the machete was not sharper than it was. And B, the headpiece, which was made out of a very thick rubber foam, um, was thick enough to stop the dull machete for what it was. Uh, so this problem, this movie probably wouldn't have either been released or because it's Hollywood, they would have probably delayed it a little bit and, you know, done whatever they were going to do. Uh, so yeah, uh, Chapman almost got a, a machete to the head. Uh, he just has to be thankful that the machete, for whatever reason, or it, it, either it was dull enough, or they just trusted each other enough, or they couldn't find a fake machete, and the machete got lodged in the in the headpiece, which is crazy. And the fact that the headpiece was thick enough uh, to stop it is uh, is amazing to me. That that is absolutely mind-boggling and crazy to to me that they did that so uh yeah so before we head out uh, i want to mention uh the, the kind of the future of the movie because i mentioned this movie had a lot of influence since then and it's true it, it has had a lot of influence but i want to talk about the future of the series because recently it was announced that james wan was in talks or is in talks rather to direct a remake for the movie which i am all for I am a fan of James Wan. I tend to either really like his projects, enjoy his projects, or even love his projects. Uh, and whether he's directing it, whether he's producing it, I I believe in James Wan. Uh, I'm pretty sure I've said it years ago. I think I probably said it when the first Conjuring came out, or I think the second Conjuring, or something around that time. Uh, that James Wan is kind of one of the one of the modern day masters of horror. At that time, I, I believed it and I, I, I still tend to believe it as much as I can because I'm a huge fan. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his. So I think it's a good hands, especially if they nail the movie down and its themes and more importantly, the design. Right. I mean, it's the Gill Man. You don't want to change too much 
of the design because then it becomes him. I'm, they're probably going to tweak it a little bit, which is fine. But as long as, you know, they keep it, you know, as close as possible to, I mean, he's a creature from the Black Lagoon. I mean, I don't know how, you know, you can mess that up too much. Um, but I want to mention this because uh, I was a huge fan of it. And I mentioned it earlier that I was going to talk about the Toro's uh, connection to the creature from the Black Lagoon before he did The Shape of Water. Because they have tried to remake the creature from a black lagoon so many times. Obviously, they've done Draculas, they've done mummies, they've done the Wolfmans, they've done versions of Frankenstein, the Invisible Man. Uh, the creature from Black Lagoon has always kind of been one of those where they just haven't really touched it. And they've been working on a remake since the 80s. So they've been working on this thing for a long time. So here's a list of directors or just big names that have been attached to this movie since then. Um, John Landis, which I know is kind of just an icky name to mention nowadays because, well, he deserved it. Uh, he deserves it. And um, But he was, a, a, who was attached at one point at Universal to produce a remake of the movie. And he wanted to bring back the original director in Jack Arnold, who was obviously still around uh, at that time. And he wanted to do it in 3D. Landis did. He wanted to, you know, basically redo the movie, re, re, you know, do it in the format of 3D uh, in the 80s because it probably would have really worked. Uh, Universal said no because the budget was for budget reasons, obviously. But they also had Jaws 3D uh, ready to go at the time. And I guess they didn't want two big 3D projects to, you know, go head to head at the box office because obviously there were, you know, not as many movies coming out as there are as there are now back in the 80s. So it sits dormant for a while. 92 rolls around. They ask John Carpenter, of all people, John Carpenter in 92 to come in. And Carpenter wanted to bring in Rick Baker. And they actually got Rick Baker to come in. And I guess he did a 3D design of the creature, uh, you know, kind of an inspiration of what he was going to look like. And for whatever reason, that never happened. Baker left. Carpenter left. And so they just never did it. And I, I think at that point, it was like, if you can't get John Carpenter, come on. And if you can't get him and Rick Baker, of all people, who obviously Rick Baker, legendary, you know, makeup artist of his own right. Uh, if you can't get them involved, like, what are, we, what are you doing? So they wait another few years, 95 rolls around. Uh, Peter Jackson, they asked Peter Jackson. But obviously, Peter Jackson has his eyes set on another big universal monster movie in King Kong. So he wants to do King Kong, and obviously, you know, he would do King Kong, you know, a little way, a little bit later. Uh, then they bring in that same, I believe that same year, no, 96, actually, 96, uh, Ivan Reitman comes in, Ghostbusters. Uh, that Nothing ever comes of that. And then Universal moves on from the Gill Man uh, and from their other creatures, and they, obviously, 99 comes out, they do The Mummy. And The Mummy is this massive hit. It's this big hit. Everyone loves The Mummy. And they're like, oh, we got it. You know, we got to do it. And they do part two. And then in 2001, you know, obviously still writing the success of The Mummy and now The Mummy 2, they asked Gary Ross to come in. Gary Ross, um, I think most people nowadays will know him as a director of the first Hunger Games movie. Uh, they asked him to come in and write and produce with his father, Arthur A. Ross, who, FYI, was one of the writers of the original movie. But again, nothing ever happened. They brought in someone, not once, but twice from that original movie, and they couldn't get it done. Well, actually, they never actually brought in Jack Arnold. But uh, they brought in Arthur A. Ross, again, one of the writers of the original movie. Uh, and in case you're wondering, yes, Gary Ross, Nepo Baby. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that for a long time. But anyway... Uh, they brought him in. Nothing, nothing comes of it. Uh, but Ross sticks around because he is one of uh, Ross's name will come up again later in, in a little bit. So he stuck around. Universal really wanted Ross to be involved in the project in some way, shape or form. Or they maybe liked his script in some way, shape or form. So they kept him on. But the next year in 2002, Guillermo del Toro. There he is again. Guillermo del Toro rose in. He has a choice to. Well, he doesn't have a choice. He was a choice to uh, direct the movie and like many adult Toro projects especially around that time their creative clashes with universal probably over story probably over budget uh it's just a classic del toro story right like his projects always end in creative differences with the studio this one was no different and obviously del toro got the last laugh because 
he went on and did uh, The Shape of Water, which, again, he has admitted is a, a homage to the creature from the Black Lagoon, you know, you know, in the fact that, you know, what would happen if the Gill Man uh, actually got the girl. And that movie won him an Oscar. So, you know, he ended up, like I mentioned, getting the last laugh and um, ended up really winning at that point. So Del Toro is gone from the project. Ross is still around. 2005 rolls around, right? So they wait a few years. Uh, they bring in Breck Eisner, a fan of the original, a self-proclaimed fan of the original as well. And he was quoted at one point when he was brought in that he wanted to movie to have the sensibility of Alien and John Carpenter's The Thing. So he knew what he was doing. And Eisner was connected for a while, and it looked like him and Ross, uh, like I mentioned, Gary Ross was still attached at one point. So they were going to be working on it in some way, shape, or form together. And they were going to, there was, you know, uh, little aspects that they were probably going to uh, do the origins of the Gill Man in some way. But I mentioned 2005. And if you remember anything about Hollywood history and anything around that time, 2007, 2008 is when the writer's strike happened in Hollywood. So they got at least far enough in the script and in pre-production where they're like, hey, yeah, we're going to do this. And then all of a sudden the strike comes around and just delays everything to that point. And then uh, the movie was delayed enough that Eisner ended up leaving and he went and did another movie that he was a really big fan of and that he loved, which still had a John Carpenter connection. And he went and did The Crazies, which I am a very big fan of. And uh, you should go watch The Crazies if you haven't already, because uh, was, that was very good. So uh, Eisner still got to do his John Carpenter movie that he wanted to do. Uh, just, you know, couldn't do The Guild Man. Uh, they try again in 2009 with uh, Carl Wrench. I think that's his last name. He would go on to make 47 Ronin, uh, but that movie never ended up happening and then 2014 rolls around and this is when the universal starts the groundwork for the dark universe uh you remember the connected universe that tom cruise is the mummy he killed that that one the creature from the black gloom was going to be part of it there were rumors that the studio wanted chris evans and scarlett johansson to appear in the remake but because the dark universe was killed opening weekend i'm still very very upset about that it, 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 all you know that version obviously never got off the ground they never even went back to it and it wasn't until recently again or like i mentioned earlier with james wan being attached uh here's hoping that that version does come to does you know come to light uh they're giving us you know a new kitchen black lagoon i mean they're giving us a new wolfman movie uh coming out in january directed by leigh Winnell, who of course did his version of the invisible man uh i know there's talk of doing a dracula movie uh, I forgot who was attached to that. I think it was Karen. Uh, I think it was Kazan. I, I can't remember. Now I can't remember her name. I think her first name's Karen. And I can't remember her last. I think, so, I think it's a K too. And I just can't remember her name. I think it's the woman who did the um, the movie The Invitation. I think she's doing a Dracula story. Uh, so these creatures, you know, the Universal Monsters, they're beloved for a reason. And you give us a movie, we're going to go watch that movie, especially if it's good, especially if it's great, like The Invisible Man, like hopefully The Wolfman will be. Uh, hopefully, you know, not as great as, you know, The, the Mummy. Uh, but uh, I can't wait to see what James Wan does. I can't wait to see what they do just with another creature from a Black Lagoon uh, movie, whether they're set in the modern day, whether it's set in, you know, in you know, yeah, as a period piece, whatever it may be, I'm excited to see the creature back on the big screen the, the guilt man back on the big screen uh, all right so that's it everybody thank you for listening to this episode i'm always figuring out new ways to do rewatches i don't want to do you know beat for beat stuff anymore uh, i know half of these half of these episodes end up being like history uh background stuff which i don't mind i like doing you know i don't, I don't mind that I, I don't know how you guys feel about that obviously let me know uh, how you feel about that but, uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. What did you think of The Creature from the Black Lagoon? Uh, have you watched it? Have you not watched it recently? Go watch it if you haven't watched it yet. It's, it's a classic for a reason. It's part of the classic Universal Monsters for a reason as well. Uh, yeah, go watch it. Uh, what do you think of the Universal Monsters themselves? Which Universal Monster movie do you want me to talk about next? Whether it's spooky season or not. Again, uh, maybe I'll just dive into the Universal Monster movies uh, in the future. So uh, thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast again. Make sure to uh, subscribe, all those good stuff. Subscribe, comment, rate, 
all that good stuff that you will do on a usual, um, <laughs> on a usual episode uh, and uh, and podcast as well. So uh, hopefully you all have a happy, safe Halloween. I'm hoping I'm releasing this on Halloween. I'm, that's that's the goal. Uh, so if I am uh, happy Halloween, uh, hope you had a good one. Hope you had a safe one, especially if you're, or or you're going to if you're listening this early. So yeah, thank you guys so much. I will see you guys in the next episode. As always, be good people, be safe out there, and go watch some movies. <laughs>